Welcome to the Public Voice Salon. We are an open dialogue on education, the arts, and social change. And we are so delighted to have as our guest today, Patty Smythe, one of the great musical artists of our time, mm -hmm. uh, a powerful singer and performer uh, whose works are just so magical. Uh, she, her songs are just unbelievable. They're timeless. Uh, the Warrior continues to get hits on YouTube, okay? It is, it is one of those get up and dance and, you know, power, powerful, powerful song. Um, songs like Goodbye to You. Um, she, she also has a new song out, which is a beautiful, touching song about the power of friendship and friendships that endure over time. It's a song about love and relationship, and I think it's perfect for the, this pandemic period that we're in. It's just a beautiful, poignant uh, tune. So, uh, and then really we're going to get into uh, education a lot in this, in this program because our show is about education. And I learned that the school that Patty went to, City As School, which is in Greenwich Village, is also the school where I did my student teaching. And this is a school that really emphasizes creativity and it's very democratic. And so we're gonna, we're gonna sort of pivot back to that. And, but why don't we begin with the beginning, Patty? Growing up in Brooklyn, in one of the few neighborhoods I've never heard of in Brooklyn, <laughs> called Garriston Beach, okay? Uh, I've been going to Brooklyn a lot in, in Williamsburg and stuff, but Garriston Beats, it's a little community, it's on the ocean, and talk a little bit about you know, how you grew up and what were some of the influences in, in terms of on your music. Well, uh, yes. thanks for having me. I just want to preface this by saying I, I came on because of our connection with City as a school. I mean, over the years, the school has asked me to do stuff, and I actually thought this was connected to the school still. I thought maybe you were still teaching there, but I didn't grow up in uh, Garrison Beach. My parents are, both grew up in Garrison Beach and I was there till I was two and a half. Mm. And then my mom moved to Manhattan. I mean, we moved, we were like total gypsies and then we moved to Queens. So I was in Whitestone and Flushing and one other neighborhood in Queens till I was 11. And then when I was 11, I moved back to Brooklyn from 11 to 15, as I call the Wonder Bread years, because that's like a rough time to go to move into a really tough neighborhood. And that was around Avenue, 14th Street, Kings Highway. That was not Garrison Beach, but close. Oh. But I don't know what neighborhood they even call that, honestly, um, because it's not Bay Ridge. It's not Sheepshead Bay. It's, you know, so so that's where I was until from 11 to 15. And then at 15, we moved back into the city. My mom ran uh, coffee houses in the village. And so uh, it, she was finally, you know, my sister moved out and it was, it was time now for her to stop commuting <laughs> in and out of the city. So we moved into like around Gramercy Park at that point. Wow, that's interesting you say coffee houses because Greenwich Village has always been known, you know, for the coffee house culture, right? That's mm -hmm. where the Bohemians and the artists were. Did that have a, an impact on you growing up? You think, absolutely. I would say, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there were bands living in our basement. My mom managed Link Ray, who was a very important uh, pioneer of rock and roll. He was a Native American. He was uh, one of the first electric guitar players, and they lived in our apartment he he and his three he had three or four piece band him and his brother and i think two other guys lived in our four room apartment our four story four room tenement apartment in brooklyn for like two months while my mom tried to get him a record deal and get him the recognition that he deserved at that time i think you know while i was singing around the house because i was i was shy about my singing i certainly wasn't shy about anything else but i didn't even though i sang all the time everyone else found it annoying and then link ray was like hey come in here let me hear what you were singing. And then he asked me to sing a little bit of this Chris Christopherson song, you know, if love of her was easier, something like that. And so I sang the line to him and he was like, that's really good. And that's all he said. And I remembered it. You know, those are those moments in your life when you're like, I heard him. And that was like a definite, you know, positive response for me. And I filed that away that, you know, Link Ray heard me. Wow. So that was one of those things. And I, my mom like knew that I wanted to sing, but not until probably a little while after that did I, um, you know, like after I left home, I think she started helping me more with my singing. No, no, right before. I mean, you know, I did a gig at Pips when I was 15. It was my, George Schultz ran that. He was tight with Lenny Bruce. My mom dated George for a while. They were friends. My sister and I were friends with his two sons. And he let me open wait for it for Andy Kaufman 
15 years old and oh. I went on a weekend to Pips and I opened for Andy Cooper and I just remember him going, going, here I come to save the day. Because I love Mighty Mice, <laughs> Ma Mighty Mouse when I was a kid. So I was right. like, what the hell is this? So that was like my first gig and I was barely, could barely play guitar. I can still barely play guitar, but I mean, I could if I wanted, if right. I actually put some effort into it. But at that point, I, I played my set myself. Like I did Cat Stevens songs and wow. you know, Fire and Rain by James Taylor. But that was my first professional show. Thanks to my mom and George Schultz. Wow. <laughs> and Andy Kaufman. <laughs> what an amazing, uh, you know, collection of influences there. Yeah. It sounds like you were gravitating more towards the folksy kind of, like, sort of... You know. No, the records I yeah. had were totally rock and roll. Okay. I mean, I had, I was, it was all Led Zeppelin and oh. Lee Hendrix and Janis Joplin and, okay. you know, old blues records and from, like, you know, it's, I, I just had a voracious appetite for music. If it was good music, I listened to it. The only thing that I never really got that much into was, like, opera. I never oh. really loved opera yeah. because it didn't, even though they, they do all these crescendos and all this shit, it's just not, mm. I don't feel it. I don't feel it because I, 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 but I mean, I'm sure that I one day will walk into an opera and feel it. But anyway, not that opera isn't great because sometimes yeah. when I'm listening to La Madame M or whatever, you know, Madame Butterfly, I hear it in the background. I'm like, wow, it's beautiful. But it just, what, that would not be one of my influences is my point. <laughs> wow. What, what, so how old were Did you have a conscious uh, memory of when you thought to yourself, gee, I can actually do this professionally, you know, make a living? Mm, I don't think I had that conscious thought. Although, you know, it's funny, like when you become successful and get a career, what people like to tell you, you said to them, mm. you know, oh, you always told me you were going to be a big star. And I'm like, I don't really think I ever said that to anyone because I kept it really on the down low. I, like I said, I was in a rough neighborhood in Brooklyn. I was not about to tell them. I didn't even tell them that I read books and went to the museum, which my sister and I would sneak. Because, oh. you know, in, tough and smart don't go together. Right. And maybe now That's it's correct. different. Back then it didn't. Right. So I, yeah. and, and, you know, to, to be, you know, dreaming such a big dream would just, you know, you'd be ridiculed for it. So I kept that definitely to myself. And I remember my, we had a big Italian family that lived across the street from us that I loved. They were like my other family because my mom was working all the time and, my friend's mom was named Marjorie, who she was killed by a drunk driver right before my oh. first record came out. But oh. she was my biggest supporter. It was funny. I mean, besides my mom, because my mom's always been a great supporter, but she would yeah. cut out articles about like, there was some like cheesy TV actor who had like a, a showbiz cam and she cut out. But I remember her best friend said, said to me one day while we were all ha sitting around this giant, you know, great yeah. Italian dinner table. Oh yeah. Do you really think you have any chance of making it? Like that's yeah. what she said to me. And I, and so I remember thinking like, wow, like who would say that to anyone, even if that was the way you felt. But I realized right. then that she was threatened by the fact that I was reaching. So I didn't really tell people, you know, I just started, mm -hmm. you know, doing it. And then uh, I guess, you know, I, when I was going to city as a school, you know, yeah. when I, I went first to, you know, we moved into the city, like I said, and I went to uh, Washington Irving, which was an all-girls school, which I didn't even know was an all-girls school for two days. That's how tough that school was. And there were so many guys outside the school that, like, whatever. So, you know, mm. I, I, I went on the deans, on the honor list. There's the first time ever. I'm, I'm a terrible truant. I never liked school. I was in the public school system, and I really just wanted to be with my mom in the village listening to music. I really didn't want to be in school, you know, like, so, but at Washington Irving, I really enjoyed my time there and I got in there. But then it became, it got to the point where like, like I said, you know, cool and smart, don't go together, tough and smart. Like I had to ask my mom to move me out of the school because something was going to happen. I had had a few altercations that I got out of, but I knew that I wasn't going to be able to keep that up. And that's when I switched to city as a school. And they gave you 10 tokens a week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, um, for English, I, you know, I was a, an assistant teacher at a nursery school somewhere. Probably it was All Souls or, you know, when a Presbyterian, who knows where it was now. I remember it was the Upper East Side. I worked at the uh, aquarium. That was one of my biology and science at the New York Aquarium out in Brooklyn. Mm. Um, whatever I did, I would, you know, help with the tours or probably, you know, clean slop and stuff. And then I worked at the, at the Bronx Zoo as well. Like they oh. let me, you know, that was part of my science thing. So I remember riding that train, you know, up to the Bronx and, uh, oh. and loving it. And 
and and then the other amazing thing that happened through City House of School, which which is such a great thing, and I had no idea that Basquiat went there or anyone else went yeah. there, honestly. Um, is that they got me a job at this repertory theater. It was called the Jean Cocteau Repertory Theater. It was on the Bowery and Bond Street. Mm. And I got exposed to all these incredible plays. And, you know, I was a, into singing and stuff. And they really, you know, I, I stayed with them for a long time. I was friends with the lady there. Because I, by this point, I'm living on my own, okay? I am in my own apartment. And I am going to high school. And I'm like 16, right? So Ooh. I'm I'm working, going to high school, and I remember, you know, becoming attached to this woman, and she wanted me to be the ingenue, like the new person at this um, theater. But I wasn't. I was more into music than I was into theater. But the Jean Cocteau Repertory Theater lasted for a really long time. It only closed recently, and I lost touch with them. You know, I, I feel like I've had 15 lives. Wow. That was like a wonderful time in my life where I will say like Blanche Dubois, that I have also Ooh. depended on the kindness of strangers, you know, Ooh. but I haven't had to like, you know, not in any kind of creepy way, just kind people who could see that, you know, I was this kid who was, you know, just trying to kind of survive and that I had a brain and that I wanted to learn and, but that I couldn't, you know, go to school from nine to five. I, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it, have a job and, you know, whatever survive. So I stayed at city as a school probably only for a year or so. And then, you know, I, I had to jump out. I, I got a GED for my mom. And then I just, but because during that time, this is what I was saying about music is anytime I went to a club and there was a band on stage, I would ask them if I could sing with them. Like, I don't know where that came from and I don't know why, oh, wow. but I felt like I needed to sing. And when I sang, I felt better. It was like my therapy. It was like my drug oh. of choice was getting up on stage and singing in front of people. And of course, a lot of the time people would say no, because I, I, first of all, when I was 16, I looked like I was 12. So, you know, they were like, who is this, you know, cute girl who's pretending she can sing. And then every once in a while they'd let me up and they'd be like, Oh, Whoa. Like we didn't see that voice coming. So, and that was fun. So that, that's sort of how it started. I just started little by little letting people know that I could sing, but I certainly wasn't shouting it from the rooftops. And I, I knew that I wanted to do it probably since I was nine. You know, but I didn't, and I was constantly woodshedding music. I mean, if, if, if my kid was sitting in her room listening to music the amount that I was, I think I would notice that. You know, my mom was so busy as a single mom that, you know, it wasn't like she was rushing to get me in music lessons. But in a way, that's better because it turned out that I just honed a very organic, you know, instinct for music. You know, I, I was learning wow. to sight read and then I stopped because I thought, I felt like that was going to mess me up. Wow. Well, well, one of the things we're trying to do with our show, uh, Patty, is to be an advocate for the arts in education and also in society, you know, and to help repair the kind of silence about education in our media. You know, you put on yeah. the TV and you get like a, you're drowning in breaking news, right, basically. Which, you breaking know, bad fear mongering. Mostly, right? Yeah. So we're trying to, you know, do something different there. And as far as City as School, I just checked their Wikipedia recently because I, I did my student teaching way back in 1997, you know, so I've sort of lost touch with them. But mm -hmm. I just uh, checked their Wikipedia. They're, they're considered now the leading experimental and, uh, you know, alternative high school in the country. And, and not only did you go there, like we said, John Michael Basquiat, who is the, considered the leading African-American painter of all time. John Michel, yeah. John Michel, I'm sorry, yeah, mm -hmm. Basquiat. Uh, Adam Horowitz from the Beastie Boys went there, okay, you know, got a fight for your right to party, you know. Uh, all, our, all us troubled kids, it's all the <laughs> <laughs> who, didn't, who don't fit the mold, you know, like yeah. that's the thing. It's like they knew I was bright, but I, I just didn't fit the mold and I, and I couldn't. I couldn't do it the way that, you know, with, with City as a School, and I'm sure they still do this, it gave me the freedom, mm. but it wasn't like, you know, nine to three where I had to be in the same spot for whatever reason that worked for me. Mm. And I also got exposed to such amazing things, you know, that helped me with my art, that helped me with my music. I mean, working at the Jean Cocteau Theater, that was wild. I also always wanted to be a zoologist and I love animals. So, you know, I was like, if I wasn't a singer, I'd be a zoologist. That's what I would do. So, I mean, it was like wow. Nirvana for me between like the, the Bronx Zoo and the New York Aquarium. I mean, I'm a, I'm a bird watching geek, you know, on top of all my rock <laughs> stuff. So it's like, like, that was like perfect. So you're really an intellectual. We're discovering the intellectual side of, 
of Patty Smythe here, and and it's yeah. I don't know about I I don't know about that, but I I certainly am. I consider myself somebody 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 who's self educated, and I and I read a lot. I mean, I'm reading a lot of crazy different things right now, like my whatever is on the table next to me on my Kindle or the two books next to me. So I love to read. I've always loved to read. That's something that the New York public school system did do for me. It, you know, I read early and so did my mother, but I have always been a voracious reader, always. Oh, wow. And I think that that's helped, I, un, no doubt has that helped me as a writer, no doubt. Has that filled me up to be wow. able to write? Oh, that's wonderful. Two weeks ago, we had Robert Klein on the show. Robert Klein, the yeah. comedian. Yes. And, he, and, he, and he's a voracious reader as well. He went to Alfred University. He always had this intellectual side. And he yeah. told me that in the last nine months, he's read 33 books. Yeah. Wow. So that's like, yeah. That's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. What have you been reading? Maybe tell us about one. I, I re I've been reading uh, the, the Ronan Farrow book, you know, Catch and Kill. I just picked that up the other day and I'm almost done with it because it's been sitting on my coffee table. My husband read it a while ago and it, oh. it's shocking. I'm really, I'm on the Matt Lauer part and I'm just like, wow. Like, cause you know, the beginning of it with Weinstein and all that, and then you get to the end and it's, it's even worse. And, um, I'm reading that. I'm reading reading, reading White or Leander. Oh right? yeah, I heard about uh, which that. That's yeah. been around. That's been sitting also next to my uh, bedside for a year or so. It was probably a Christmas gift, or I bought it. I don't even know. And I'm also reading a Scandinavian crime. I'm very much into Scandinavian crime novels, and that's on my Kindle. And so I, it's a name that I can't uh, pronounce, but it's. Uh, I read Joe Nesbo. I read a lot. So I'm reading three at once right now. <laughs> well, I do the same thing. No, I yeah. juggle. It's like, it's crazy. So you mentioned your husband who was John McEnroe, uh, the great tennis player. Uh, did, did I mention him? You said your husband. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, John. You, brought, you, uh, you said, you said okay. your, your husband was reading the book, you said, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. I did. That's right. Okay. He was reading. He, well, yeah, was he loved reading. the book. Yeah. You guys talk about what you're reading together? Do you discuss literature? What's interesting is that, yeah. that that he likes biographies and oh. political stuff. So he's not into like you know novels and literature. He like he, I think maybe he likes some historical novels, but he's not as big a reader as I am. But he's a much he reads much more since we've met. That's for sure. So he reads the newspaper and mm. you know stuff like that. And then I, I, what is he reading right now? Um, Someone's biography. I just saw him reading it last night. Um, <laughs> let me tell you what it's Okay, is. okay. Hold on, hold We on. could do this on Zoom. This is something we can do, ladies and gentlemen. The only good thing about this That's crazy right. pandemic. Oh, yes. You know what? He's reading about Jimmy Carter. He loves Jimmy Carter. Good for he him. He just is such a huge, just good. the kindness and the, you know, I mean, oh. Jimmy Carter was such a, yeah. Wow. So he's reading the book, uh, very good things or something like that. Yeah, yeah whatever the new Jimmy Carter book is. So that's what he's reading. Good for him. You know, I was doing a lot of research on you for this interview, uh, <laughs> uh, Patty. And, and, and one of the things I saw was this uh, performance where you did, I think it was on John's show when he had a talk show. And, 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 and you were singing a song and he was playing guitar for you. I said, how sweet is that? He was helping you. Uh, with, with, you know, he was there in the band with you. It was from way back, you know, when he had the show. But they said that the upcoming guest was going to be Ralph Nader. And I thought, ooh, yeah, very progressive. He's always liked Ralph Nader. I think he might have voted for Ralph Nader a couple of times even. Yeah. Ralph Nader's another altruistic, you know, kind of interesting, very smart guy. My husband, he, he's really politically. Uh, okay. You know, they were trying to talk us into running for mayor, you know, him, him or me. So <laughs> at a dinner party the other night. So <gasps> they're like, so it's funny, like he's, he's always sort of played around with that idea. I don't know that he'll do that. That's a thankless, you know, hard job, but he's very okay. smart and he's very ethical. So he, he could do it, I guess. But that's, like I said, that's a tough gig. I, I could, he could do it. Cause I remember him years ago. He always had a strong voice, you know, he never took any guff. He, that was his, uh, his identity, right? He was like, you know, with the empires, remember he was always, uh, you either love him or hate him for that though. That's well, the problem. I love him for it. We love him. We think he's great. Yeah. It, and he's got a strong voice. You have a strong voice. W would you have thought of running for mayor of New York? Was that considered or no, that, that oh. but it was New York. I mean, they were oh. talking about John and then like okay. the people I was sitting with were like, you're the one who should run. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. But but whatever, just, that was just a joke. It's funny. I don't know that he'll ever actually do that, but it's not like we haven't talked about it because we have. Well, my idea would be for you to both run as a couple. How about that? 
You heard it that'd here be, first. That'd be new. That'd be a new approach. That would be breaking news then, right? If you. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Interesting. So, uh, you ever thought of writing a memoir, Patty? You have such a fascinating life. Definitely. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm lazy. It's like I, I've written a lot of short stories and a lot of my stories go into my songs, but okay. yeah, I, I need to write. I need to write it before I forget it all, you know, because that's what's going to happen. I'm going to forget it all. And, uh, you know, soon enough. So, and there's so much. Like I said, I just feel like I've had so many different lives, but. Yeah, I need to write it. My mom wrote a little memoir about running away to the circus. I mean, I could just spend, most of my book would be before I got famous. Honestly, that to me is the most fascinating part of my life before, I mean, before I got famous, not that I got that famous, but before I, you know, I became like a recording artist, I should say. Mm. It's the, you know, just my crazy ass bohemian life, you know, <laughs> is like, like, I didn't realize that no one, but, that other people didn't really live like we lived, you know, yeah. for a while. <laughs> People love that, Patty. People yeah. move to the village now because they want to be around that, even though the village is not like that anymore. I mean, it's much more she-she and all that, but people feel the spirit. And the fact that you live that life, I think it's fascinating, you know, that uh, yeah. you tell that Someday story. Someday i got to get it together and write it. I yeah. will, one of these days. Wow. You know, I want to just uh, share with you in the world also about the song The Warrior, which I've been using a lot in my classes. Um, and most recently, yeah, I was, how do you use it? Well, here we go. I was teaching at Stevens University in Hoboken. We live in Hoboken, New Jersey, my wife and I. And Stevens is a world class, you know, uh, university that focuses mostly on engineering and science and computers. But we have a humanities department and I teach English as a second language. OK, so I have mm -hmm. students who are like very shy and a lot of them are from China and from India. And I try to get them to really open up and be, you know, sort of not be afraid to express themselves, go for their dreams. And I, and I tell them a little bit about City as School and the philosophy of that, you know, the pedagogical mm -hmm. implications of that. Then I segue into your video, The Warrior, where you're up there and I am the warrior, you know, and it's like, I see the kids, they're like, oh my God, this is incredible. You know, they're, it, it is a, a, a sense of joyfulness that comes into the room. You could see it in their eyes, you know, that the women, mm -hmm. It's very empowering. There's something empowering. And if you look at the warrior now, if you go online, you'll see people continue to respond to it. Yeah. And, and in a very positive way, there's one woman who said, oh, my daughter just beat cancer. You know, she's a warrior, you know. Right. So that's kind of like channeling your inner warrior, your inner spirit, your creative warrior. And um, in fact, I think we're going to title this show Patty Smythe, The Making of a Creative Warrior. That's <laughs> my, Okay. So if you could think about that, how did you become a creative warrior? I mean, you're, you're talking about it already. I mean, it's, it's, it's... I mean, you know, I just think that, mm. I mean, it was very different when I started out. There weren't, you know, to be a female, you know, warrior, first yeah. of all, because I think that's, that's, you know, not that I ever thought about that, you know, because my mom ran all of these clubs. I was raised by a single parent. I didn't think that the world treated men and women differently because in my, not in my world. My mom was the boss in my world. So uh. strong women were in my world. Um, I never saw her be subservient to anyone. Still mm. not to this day have I ever seen her. So for me, it, it was like, oh, you know, I'm just going to. And for me to go into the music business, mm. you know, that was not a rebellious thing for me to do. It was, it was sort of a natural thing to happen. I was, grew up around music. I loved music. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to be in it. If for me to rebel, I would have you know, gone into the sciences or something, or maybe been a lawyer, you know, that would have been a way for me to oh. go, you know, off of my mom always wanted to be a movie star, always wanted, then she you know, was a dancer, a singer, joined oh. the circus first and did all this stuff. So, you know, like she was a great example for me. Although she, I don't think she told me that she ran away to the circus until I was like, you know, almost like a teenager or something. I'm like, I heard a reference to cir some circus or I'm like, what? Or I found a picture of her in a, I mean, you can't say midget, like a, a little person running through the rain, you know, yes. in, in Florida. And I was like, who is this? And she's like, well, that's me and Tiny. I was like, what? So then, you know, she had a lot of lives too and sort of forgot to, you know, catch us up on some of them. Wow. So, you know, when you're, when, when that's sort of like your main person in your life, you know, there wasn't, it didn't seem that risky to become a singer or to, or to dream for that. I mean, it, it still is risky to get up on stage and to try to do it. but 
when I did eventually get a record deal, because uh, I probably started singing, you know, in bands when I was 19 or 20, and I got a record deal when I was 26, I think, 25 or 26, right? Wow. But I had been singing around New York and in Philly and all that. And when we had our record come out and we went out on the road and all, to did all the promotion, we did a promotional tour first where me and Zach Smith, who is my partner in the band, he's the one who started Scandal. Um, oh, oh. They literally said, we're, we can't add your record because we have a, a chick, you know, there's a female on this week. We're not adding your record. So sorry. And they do this. They drop the needle down at, like on each track. Right. Uh. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? i like, because of Pat Benatar or Christy Hind or who Stevie Nicks or Linda Ross, whoever it was. And there weren't many. If they mm. had a record out, then That's they right. wouldn't play my record. And that is how it went. And so Goodbye to You probably would not have been a hit if it were not for MTV. If it was not for the fact that Zach said, we should make a video. We had made a video and that's how we got the record deal. Well, you know, we were in doing demos and he was like, let's do a video. So we did a video of Line On You and then, right. you know, then, then we found this Goodbye to You song that wasn't finished. We finished it. And then we did a demo of that and that's how we got our record deal, right? Because wow. the guy was like, forget it. They don't need to do demos. But to hear yeah. when I first went out that, you know, women, you know, there's only one woman a week and then i would get these questions like oh who are your favorite who are your favorite female singers I'm like i didn't think about hmm. male or female i just like whoever spoke to me you know i, I wasn't looking for chicks to like hmm. you know i mean i loved otis redding i love sly and the family stone uh, i love uh. you know um dion warwick to carol king to aretha franklin to um you know glenn campbell was fantastic. Mm. The Carpenters were Campbell. There was so much great music growing up, mm. but I never thought about like, you know, I wanted to be a, a singer. I wasn't thinking I want to be a chick singer. I just wanted to be a singer. And it's really interesting how it was like, who are your female? I don't, I don't know who my female, who, who, whoever happened to be good got onto the list, but I wasn't searching them out, you know, like, oh, I can only listen to women because I can only identify with women. Come on. I mean, yeah. music is transcends we hope everything, gender, race, you know, economics, all of it. So it was kind of shocking. And then, you know, as a woman, I got so much pushback on anything that I asked for that then I was labeled a bitch. Because if you don't do, you know, if you don't say yes to everything, now I only said yes to 90% of shit instead of 100% of it. Mm. And so then you get the label of being a difficult artist. So, I mean, that a guy would never, they would, they would get in on about my clothes and doing this and doing that. They'd never do that to a guy, never. So I, then all of a sudden I was like, wow, man, this is a different world than, than I thought it was. So mm -hmm. at that point, you know, like I, in the beginning, I was kind of like, oh, okay, well, they must know. They've been in the business a long time. And I sort of went along with some of them. Like I did not want that warrior video to come out. I did really? not want to do that warrior video. Oh. And I think the chick who made my costumes and did all, like hated me. She made me look as bad as she possibly could. You, oh. you could not even recognize me from that video. Honestly, no one recognized me. I had a top seven hit, right? Yeah. For months and no one recognized me because I had so right. much shit on my, and she cut all my right. hair off and all this stuff. But I just wanted to do a performance video. Like I, I liked all the creatures and, I yeah. thought that video was going to be performance and yeah. some of those creatures where it would be kind of tongue in cheek and fun instead of it being this like serious, dark thing. Yeah. So bizarre. And they would not listen to me. And then uh, the next video, the next single on that song was beat of a heart. That's what was coming up on AOR radio, which doesn't exist anymore. And because the producer wrote hands tied, he pushed my label to push hands tied second. But sometimes you have to let things happen. You know, Beat of a Heart needed to be second, and then I believe Hands Tied would have done better. But no matter what, you know, they weren't listening. And then at that point on the Warrior record, I'm like, you know what? They don't know what they're doing. Like, they don't really know what they're doing. Like, they're just making, yeah. you know, I mean, I loved Al Teller. He was a real advocate of mine on, um, on at Columbia and at MCA. But then at the end of the day, it was... You know, I guess I'm reading the Throne and Farrow book, so it's an, you know, it's a, it's an it affecting me because just NBC and you know the old boys club and that was really at Columbia and, M and MCA and you know they just they just tried to push you around a little bit. So by the time I jumped off of that label and 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 went to my next record, I think I realized that you know 
I had to write the songs because the songs weren't that great that were coming to me after Holly Knight and you know Mike Chapman wrote some great songs for me. But after that, I was like, well, I guess I better start writing songs <laughs> mm. and saying what I want to say. But you mm. know, I mean, I think I was I had a lot of luck. I wasn't super ambitious. That's the truth. I didn't live, breathe, and you know, sleep this. I wanted I wanted both. I wanted a career and I wanted a, a regular life. And I've tried to walk that line. It's not an easy line to walk, you know, but um, so I, I think that I just was, that warrior song came to me for a reason. You know what I mean? Like if I thought about those lyrics, like shooting out the walls of heartache, bang, yeah. bang. Right. I mean, right. that's kind of a goofy lyric in a way, but yeah. I loved singing that song so much. Uh -huh. And it felt so good to flex my muscles on that song. And it still does. It still feels great to sing it. I'm happy that I can still sing everything in the same keys that I wow. did back then, which is awesome. So it still has the same sort of like, wow. and it feels great. Wow. So wow. that song was sort of made for me in a way, oddly. And Holly and I are friends. And it's just funny. Holly Knight wrote it. But it's just funny how I was the chick for that song. <laughs> wow. And, and I'll just tell you, the meaning that that song has to me, part of it is I already explained because I use it in, in teaching, you know, to empower my students to not be afraid and to go for their dreams. But also in my own life, here's a book that I just finished writing, uh, a memoir about a famous actress who was in my family. Her name was Blanche Walsh, and there she is. She's been forgotten, okay? She's yes. a great forgotten actress, but look at that warrior. She was a warrior. She basically rescued my grandmother from an orphanage in London, brought her to New York in 1909. There's my grandmother right there. Wow. She became mm -hmm. my grandmother's second mother. The book is called Blanche Walsh and Me, a memoir of Broadway and Hollywood royalty, because I came to find out that Blanche Walsh was the prototype for a movie star. Just doing research on it, in 1912, she was in a, a movie based on a Tolstoy novel about love and social justice called Resurrection. That was Tolstoy's third novel. Uh, nobody remembers it because it wasn't War and Peace and Anna Karenina, but it was his most right. radical, his most provocative, and his most political book. And in 1912, Adolf Zucker, who was the grand architect of Hollywood, used that movie to elevate motion pictures to an art form and to create mm. the notion of a movie star with Blanche Walsh. Wow. And so she is like a warrior. I love the name Blanche, too. Nobody likes it but me, though. I'm like, name your kid Blanche. It's such a pretty name. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Blanche Dubois. But here's the warrior shot. Look at that. Yeah, great. Tell me that's not a warrior, okay? That's, that's a warrior. Fantastic. That Egyptian look. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. So here we are. We have to, we have to be warriors, and uh, we have to be warriors for peace, for love, for justice. And, uh, yes. So let's use that to segue into your new song, which is a very loving song, and maybe talk about, you know, this idea of relationships and how that brought you to this song. You know, I mean, the whole world is based on relationships. I oh. mean, everything is a relationship between a teacher and a student, a mother and a daughter, a husband and a wife, mm. a man and a woman, a woman and a woman, a man and a man, you know, a brother and sister, a sister and sister, uh, you know, me and my doorman. I, who I've known for 30 years. They're my friends, okay? They're like my family. It's true. I mean, I've lived in this building. That's the New York way. And I, you know, I mean, we have a relationship. So it's funny. It's like, why do people always talk about, you know, because, I mean, I could just sort of go in my head and make stuff up, which I do sometimes, mm. but I am, I am an observer of people and I am a mother of daughters and I am a daughter of a mom like that's all i ha ever had was a mom not not a dad so you know it's these things inform who i am you know i have three daughters I've, and i have four daughters I've, including my stepdaughter um so you know i just think that for me i've been touring all this time not putting out records start trying to put out records writing songs the whole time but touring and then getting distracted by other stuff you know raising six kids six mm. kids is, is not oh. easy and that's what I've been doing, you know, when I step yeah. back and, you know, and for me, I'm going to say this, I'm going to preface this before I get into that song. I had a crazy, wild and fun bohemian childhood. For me to be married, I'm coming up on my 24th wedding anniversary next week. For me to be with somebody th this uh -huh. long is something I never saw for myself. I, that is a brave new world for me. So for me to have like to get in and be a, a, in a partnership with somebody 
and actually get why people get married. Because I, I was like, why do people even get married? Like, they're all miserable. Like, <laughs> this is sucks and it's a lie. I mean, that's where I was when I met him. So, you know, the fact that I've hung in here and somehow we've worked it out to mm. me is, is one of the biggest accomplishments along with having a platinum record of singing on the Oscars, whatever, all these things. But yes. it's just, so for me, for everyone else, that may seem, oh, that's just normal stuff, but not for me because I didn't, I, what was normal for me was like a mom who ran away to the circus and had Link Ray living at her apartment and who ran nightclubs, you know, that's, that's a very different normal. So, uh. you know, that, that's what's been going on the last 25 years or whatever. So, uh -huh. you know, I, you know, and, and when you marry somebody like the person I married, you mm. know, people change around you. You know, it's funny. It's like, I don't think I've changed that much. I mean, I've probably changed over the years some, but, you know, people can't handle it. They, they can't. Mm. And it was funny to watch, you know, because watch how people see you or, or judge you or, or, or sometimes I think they think things that aren't there, but it's because they're a little bit intimidated or whatever. So it has affected some friendships. Now, my sister and I, the song you're talking about is Drive, I believe, right? Is that it? Yes. Is it Drive? Drive, Drive. correct. So yeah. Drive was, you know, my sister and I, I just felt like there was this huge chasm between us. And we, it was just me and her growing up. It was, you know, there wasn't it. And a lot of times we were against each other, but for the most part, we were aligned together. And then it just seemed like we were really, really far apart and it really felt bad to me. And I didn't know if it was bothering her at all because she's my older sister and she's always been able to sort of just not respond. Like she can sort of switch the switch off and then, and you don't know. So it was bothering me. It was a thing that was hurting my heart, honestly. And uh, I was out in LA and I, I started two songs with this guy, Gerald O'Brien. I started that song drive and then uh, I'm going to get there right I had no idea what drive was going to be and it's funny because I listened to the demo and it was a little bit faster I'm like I wonder if I should have done it faster but anyway so I came back to New York I knew I knew do 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 like I had that in my head huh. and I walked into my room into my closet which is next door and I looked down yeah, I just was standing like, what am I going to like I couldn't get the melody out of my head and then I, I found a photograph of my sister and I Oh. And um, it's here, actually. This was one of them. Okay. Um, I framed it since then. But this oh. was a picture of us in Manhattan, you know, when oh. they brought ponies around, and that was the Upper West Side, right? Ooh. So I found a picture of us when we were kids, and I just wrote her this love letter, you know, a, a love letter. Um, mm. And who knew that COVID was going to come? But, you know, the truth is, is that if we could just get into the car and, and drive back to those enchanted days in Queens where we lived under this canopies of trees and mm. you know just were free and happy and you know rolling around in the grass and riding our bikes and you know just um free and happy and so I think I was trying to say to her you know like let everything go that's happened you know can we come back to that place again and I think it really did help you know, I sent it to my sister a bunch of times and I got no response. And then finally, you know, my mother got sick. My mom's okay now, but she got lung cancer and she's oh. doing fine. But that forced my sister and I together. Mm. And it was hard because she hadn't heard the song and she was still, it turns out I was right. She was sort of angry or whatever. Mm. And so finally, you know, after we had had some, some altercation, you know, minor rubs or whatever, mm -hmm. You know, we talked a little bit and then I sent her the song. I said, I want you to listen to the song. And I sent her the song and then she said to me, well, I'm crying now. You know, oh. she goes, you made me cry. And I said, well, I wrote the song for you. And she goes, well, I'm crying more now. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I, I don't want you to cry. That's not what it was. But I, I, I felt like she needed to know what, what she meant to me, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes, you know, you're lucky enough when you write that you can make those amends that way because I, I couldn't hmm. I couldn't say it because I, I, I couldn't see what was wrong so I just wrote out like this is what I would like for it to be you know mm. like one of the lines that I didn't keep in the song was I made a mix of all your favorite songs just to say I'm sorry for whatever went wrong you know so it's like I had so many things of just like you know let's rewind it would be nice to rewind sometimes 
Mm. And I think COVID hit, out comes drive, and all anyone wants to do is fucking get in a car and drive out of what's happening, you know? So mm. I think a lot of people were probably thinking back on on where they grew up or where they were from or where they want to go. Yes, yeah, it's amazing the power of art. It is a healing power. Uh, there's a quote by John Dewey, who was a great philosopher of education, said, the aesthetic is the opposite of the anesthetic which puts you to sleep. So these right. the arts keep us up, they keep us alive, you know, and they could help repair deficiencies in the social order, uh, the power of imagination. There's a, so, there's a poem by Wallace Stevens called The Blue Guitar. It's about the man with the blue guitar who does not play things as they are, but as mm -hmm. they might be, right? So the art and imagination, thinking of how things might be, you know, in, in a better world. And, terms of our it's relationships. It's so important. It's so yeah. important. And you know, I didn't have a lot of art classes in school. Okay. Um, my sister went to music and art high school, so she did. And uh, but you know, there I don't remember taking music in school. You yeah. know, everything was the radio yeah. and my mom's record collection and then my record collection, you know, and I, I do know, know that um that there were orchestras there, you know, I just, it just, I was again, not that kid that, oh, I'm going to join the orchestra, you know, like not really thinking that I was singing rock and roll songs and, you know, and Jackson five songs or whatever. But, but I do know that drawing and, and music and art has, you know, just transcended and saved so many people on so many levels just to be able to write wow. because that's an art. Now that's what I learned at school to write, I guess, to read and write. And that's a gift to really wow. love, books and to be able to disappear yes. into them you know is a really amazing thing and that's something i think also that's sort of slipping away my children have been lucky to have really good educations thank god you know better educations you know they, they were in private school because we could afford it and uh because the public schools just you know are struggling now and i i just don't get it you know the city has so much money and i don't get why we don't support education Arts and education, music and education, athletics, because, you know, athletics is, is, is important. You know, mental health is directly related to wow. physical activity. Wow. I mean, it's like kids got to move. Yes. Well, when Patty Smythe becomes mayor of New York City. That's right. With or without uh, her husband, John McEnroe, either or, you know, we're going to straighten this out. You know, you made me remember when I was a little boy and my grandmother, who I was very close to, uh, who she was brought to America by this actress, she had dreams of being a singer, you know, which she never realized, but she would sing to me around the house, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I still know all the words to baby face, right? Baby face. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. cutest little baby face, you know, songs mm -hmm. like that. And and, uh, and she used to say to me, John, if I could only get on the Joe Franklin show, that was, that was her dream. If I could get on, remember wow. Joe Franklin would have Memory Lane? Remember Joe Franklin's Memory Lane? I don't think I ever went on the Joe Franklin show, yeah. and I should have gone on the Joe Franklin show. Yeah. And I may have gone on the Joe Franklin show, and I have forgotten <laughs> Okay, that's how bad my memory is, but that's, that's pretty funny. God, did we all watch that show, though? Yeah. You know what? My grandfather, who was Scottish, was really into poetry. You know, oh. he was a huge influence on me. He was very well educated, oh. and he was into Robbie Burns and Shakespeare and all of these. He would constantly be reading poetry to me. And when I, we, you know, luckily, oh. like, he, he was still alive while I was singing, and I put a record out, and he was so proud that I was a singer because he used to sing, you know, all these Scottish folk songs all the time. Mm. I mean, it's just, the, you know, that part of the world, they're just musical. They're, they're just singing and writing and, you know, spouting poetry all the time. Oh and that goodness. was a huge influence on me. It definitely made me want to write poetry. And I did start to write poetry. He turned me on to a lot of great poetry. We discovered a key link here in your biography with your, your grandfather, your Scottish my, grandfather. How my fast, Scottish grandfather, yeah. How, how fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that guy behind me on the wall, that Mr. Presley there, that young Elvis Presley, was actually part Scottish as well, okay? Mm -hmm. And I, the reason he's on my wall, because I grew up as a kid, I was like a total fish out of water. When everybody was like into Kiss and Led Zeppelin, I was like the biggest Elvis fan in the world. My friends right. would make be. I'd be home watching like clam bake and they'd be right, out, come right, on right. out, you know, and, uh, but that painting was done by my mom. So it's a very touching painting because my mom, Great. Did, mom let me tell very... you something though about Elvis Presley. Please, yeah. My mom was, was single and I did not ever want her to get married ever except yeah. to Elvis Presley. And I figured oh, it out. Yeah. She was only a year older and I would sit and watch, you know, 
Bye Bye Birdie, whatever the heck was yeah. on. I was right. like, Mom, you've got to marry Elvis Presley. You're only a year older than him. You're beautiful. I mean, I was obsessed with the idea, and that was the only person that I would accept was Elvis Presley. <laughs> That is so funny. He never married again. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> the um, curse of Elvis Presley. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, researching this interview, I, I, I looked to see what some of my competitors have done with you in the past. And we saw Howard Stern, the interview with Howard Stern, and the interview with uh, David Letterman. How am I doing so far compared to Mr. Stern and Mr. Letterman? Well, that, that, I'm sorry. This is a very different thing than, the, you know. than that. This is, that right, was live right. TV, okay? I know that was more reading. exactly. This is a different yes. type of thing. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're trying to create a different type of uh, a yeah, show. yeah, more, more, more thoughtful. Could more... not be in the realm of, of Howard. I love Howard. No, no, no. Yeah, I know. I love him. That's a whole think, other beast. He's one of my favorites. He's. I think he's funny and he's insightful. And he also said, Howard, I read something about him that he wants to do better interviews now. He's sort of getting away from the shtick. When he had you on, it was like the, that. That was the height of the shtick, Howard. Right. Yeah, he was still pretty respectful of me, but yeah, yeah. he was the highest chick. I don't think he, he never crossed a line with me, though. He always liked me, and I mean, we're friends. Yes. I, I like him, yes. too. Yeah. I, I think he's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think he's wonderful. Um, was Linda Ronstadt ever an influence? Because she was very big at the time. When you, you know, were... it's weird about that. Ah. Honestly, I would say that her very first song when I was little, little kid was You and I, down to the beat of right. a different drum, right? With the Stone Pony, that was the name of the band. It's and that so, was yeah. a song that Mike Nesmith wrote, I think, from the Monkees or whatever. It was one of those like early hits, or by Carol, somebody like that, not her. And so I remember that song, and I loved that song. I loved her singing that song. And I, I know I must have seen her on TV, but the truth is, I was talking to my husband about this. I wasn't that into the California, oh. the Southern California rock scene. I just wasn't. I was deeply entrenched in New York. And though... Linda Ronstadt, when I, I just watched her biography, so I just want to say, I want to skip over that. I didn't, but the biography was yes. mind blowing. Because Documentary, yes. Yeah. She, she in, a, in such an understated way, yes. conquered everything that she wanted to do. And I mean, I have mad, mad mm. respect for her because it's just like, it's unbelievable. But I wasn't really you know, listening to her that much. But I mean, I was aware, obviously, when she had hits of Desperado, and then she did that, right. that sort of punk rock thing. She did uh -huh. the Elvis Costello song, but I was, it wasn't like she was a big influence of mine. But okay. man, I'm, I'm super impressed with her. Because it's the category of women, you know, finding their voice at a time when you had all of that patriarchy. I mean, now we're living in this time of like women empowerment, but then feminism was just coming out. And I'm sure it was hard for you and other women. You know? But for Linda Ronstadt, who came like long before yeah. me, she yeah. just did it. it she wasn't mm -hmm. like, it was funny because she wasn't really making any stands. She just quietly and forcefully said, I'm going to do a Mexican-American record or a complete Mexican, you know, whatever that, or I'm going to do a punk thing, or I'm going to make a st American storybook record and I'm going to use, you know, Nelson Riddle. I mean, what? Like mm. she just got it done. And it, it, that is either, you know, not only you have to give her props for that, but you got to give her management props for that. I think that was like I Elliot, I can't remember his last name, but, uh, you know, they backed her up. I mean, she didn't have to make, you know, a big stink or whip her top off or, you know, walk mm. around in a G-string. She just was like, this is what I'm going to do. And she just right. did it. Not male, female. That transcends male or female again. I don't care what, you know, what gender you are. To have done that many different genres of music and have gone platinum with every single thing that you went into is mind-blowing. No one's done that. No other artist has done that has like oh. gone the gamut of like from her roots to Nelson Riddle, to punk rock, to Southern rock, to country, all of it. And oh. she killed it all. Well, you're still in there pitching, Patty. I mean, you can still, there are mountains you can climb and right, there's. Yeah, it, it, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. That's what they say, so or yes. As Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over, right? That's right. 
Uh, now, just in terms of, uh, I was thinking about new wave, because I read somewhere that they classify you in kind of with the new wave, but punk also was very big at that time. So where, where does... It was probably new wave. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't really like punk music. I'm going to be honest. Like I was all into like the sound of Philadelphia then. The late 70s had such great soul music. Yes. None of those people could sing, they, you know, or play. And, you know, there were a few exceptions. There was Blondie and Talking Heads. And, you know, there were, some, there were some great bands that came out of New York. But for the most part, I was, like, not interested. I know that went totally to CBGB? square. You never but went I was to in... CBGBs? You never went to CBGBs? I went to CBGBs, and I went down to the Mud Club and stuff like that. But, you know, I was... At those years, I was working in comedy clubs. You know, I was at the... I was a Catch a Rising Star in the comic strip. So oh. at, the, at Catch a Rising Star on the weekends, it would be three comics and a singer. So I would be the singer. And then I waitress at the comic strip. So I was in the comedy world. I wasn't really in the punk world. I lived in the East Village, but I wasn't, you know, that music just, it just didn't interest me. Hmm. It was like, I, I, I found it to be people who weren't that talented, honestly, you know, who just wanted to be musicians. That's what I thought then. I don't think that now, but right. if they didn't sing great, you know, then they weren't that interesting to me. And, they, and you know, it was all about melodies for me and chord changes and lyrics. And so, like I said, except there were a few exceptions. I remember seeing the, uh, the New York Dolls. I saw the New York Dolls at the Mercer Hotel before it collapsed. How about that? So I, had, I was 15. And oh that oh was crazy. And I remember thinking, they're funny. You yes. know, like it was fun, yes. but it wasn't like, wow, this is like unbelievable music, but it was an unbelievable spectacle. And, it, and I'm so happy that I was there, that wow. I got to see that. Wow. I'm, I wasn't sure if I should mention Richard Hell or not. Is that, would that be okay to mention? Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what was that like, Rich? Because, you know, I actually walked into the Strand Bookstore like not too long ago, and I saw a book by Richard Hell, and I'm like, he's a pretty good writer, you know? He's emerged as a, as a writer. I think he's a good writer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's a good writer. He's a very smart guy. Uh, so we have a good daughter, but we weren't together very long. You know, I, I met him through mutual friends. I had no idea what he did. I did not know anything about him and he didn't know anything about me. It was weird. So it just sort of like we tripped and fell over each other at this big party. And then, you know, as time went on, I mean, you know, I, I just didn't know from television or the blank. I know the void. It's no idea. Boy, and then when I saw it, I didn't really want to have any idea. It looked pretty dark, you know. It looked pretty like scary and dark. So, yeah. so we, um, you know, somehow we, you know, had our moment and fell in love and made a beautiful daughter, Ruby. But you know, it was very short. It was it was uh, mm. short. So, uh, you know, no ill will. He's my daughter's dad, and uh, he's got a good uh, IQ, and so does my daughter. So that's right. cool with me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we know this, this hour went by so quickly, and as we wind up, I'd like to look toward the future, always thinking, you know, positively, what, what, what is next in terms of what mountains to climb, what dreams yet to achieve, and creatively or otherwise? Or? You know, I, I really just want to keep making records and putting them out and not, you know, obviously waiting so long or being too critical about them, and I just have to really stay uh disciplined about writing you know i i do write but you know i have to sit and do writing dates with people that's that's something that you know i have a place in nashville now so i'm going to be spending more time down there oh. because everybody all the musicians and the writers are down there right now oh. and i think i really have to start writing this book you know put together this book of short stories that i started and then really work on you know just doing this 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 crazy story of my life that no one would believe you know i mean oh you know, that I can barely believe it. I, and, yeah. you know, I guess really, you know, my, my, my youngest daughter's about to graduate college and we're finishing a house in Malibu where we have another home. We've been there, you know, we spend most half of our time there now. And this, this during the quarantine, we spent most of our time there. Okay. So just sort of just trying to, uh, mm. you know, ease up a little bit on the stress level and just try and have as much, you know, music and art and in our lives and just sort of kind of uh, smell the roses a little bit you know i've been working really hard believe it or not <laughs> for the last 20 something years so i yes. i but you know working on music isn't hard to me so i don't even consider that as work you know the hard work was raising sick kids yeah. doing music and i just yes. want to get on the road that's that's my number one that's the thing that brings me the most joy 
is uh, is going onto a stage and singing. Oh, yes. So you know that's what I want. And I we're supposedly have some dates in September. I hope that is able to happen. And I just want to get out there and see my fans. They've been asking me for a new record for a long time, and I finally you know came through, which I'm happy for. And I feel bad it took so long. I said I was going to call it. It's about effing time because it took so long <laughs> to put the, mu the the record out. So I just want yeah. to keep touring and keep playing and you know make up some for some lost time. There is that that sounds wonderful and it's similar to teaching because I haven't been teaching in the past year because of the pandemic and I miss the classroom so badly. Yeah. Oh my darling wife Claudia who's been here the whole time. I want you to see my lovely wife Claudia <laughs> Canasto Chibuki from Bogota, Colombia, okay? I love Colombia. And yeah. I love Colombians. I've been in Colombia two times, yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> where, 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 Patty? Where well, were we were in um, uh, what's the beach town where everyone goes now? Cartagena. 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 Sorry, my my friend is Colombian, so he has a place there. Yeah, yeah. Oh. His whole family is Michan. They're from Colombia, so yeah. So I went a couple <laughs> of times with him. But Colombians are great, man. I know a lot of Colombians in New York. We got a lot of Colombians in New York. <laughs> good heritage, good food, oh. heritage. Good culture, yes. Claudia tells me whenever she knows that I get depressed when, when, when I haven't been teaching, you know, she's like, because she knows I feed off that energy of being in the classroom. It's almost like yeah. you're performing in a way, and it's, a, it's this dialogical relationship yeah. that you have Definitely. with the audience, and you Definitely, feel it as yeah. well. As well. Mm -hmm. Claudia, how much time we have left, my dear? I think we're done, aren't we? I think we could yeah. be. Is it, okay. One more minute before everything's going to break loose. We're going <laughs> to wrap it up, the door. okay. They're so coming through the door. I want to thank you so much, uh, Patty Smythe. We've been with, we've had the delight to be with you for the past hour. Uh, one of the great musical artists of our time, still very much on the top of her game with her new song, Drive. And it's been thank really you, a delight uh, to thank get you. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah, cool. <laughs> all the best in the future. Okay, God bless. And you too. Good luck with your projects, okay? And thank keep on so teaching. Much. Thanks for your service. Appreciate it. Thank you, Patty. Yes, thank, you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.